How do you even drink that? Because it's delicious. What? what? Cola's famous red and white logo conceals a bloody history underneath. From murders of union members in South America to the depletion of an entire village of water in India, to many, Coke has been a force of evil. The company has grown too large for any community, nation, or global government to contain. From more than 200 countries, the company rakes in $45 billion a year. Every day, over 2 billion Cokes are sold. How it built that global brand is a tale of conspiracy, corruption, and violence, all the while fueling a global epidemic the world has never seen before. I'm Mike with List25, and today we delve into the controversial story of the most iconic drink in history that you've never been told. The Magic of Advertising In one of the final battles of the American Civil War, a lieutenant colonel named John Pemberton suffered a near-fatal injury, a sword to the chest. Miraculously, Pemberton survived, but his pain was debilitating. He soon slipped into a dependence on morphine, long after he returned to his civilian life as a pharmacist. It was through this desperate addiction that he began experimenting with different medicines, and in 1884 found a sweet spot using wine combined with cola nut and cocaine, both of which were popular at the time. When he removed the alcohol in 1886, Pemberton had created the very first Coca-Cola. He believed he had created a brain tonic, an intellectual beverage, fit for treating any number of illnesses. At its base, though, was a sweet syrup, which he soon realized could be commercially successful. He then left his medical and pharmaceutical degrees behind, launching himself into the world of business. Pemberton created a company, sought out financing, and partnered with a salesman named Frank Robinson, who came up with the name Coca-Cola, and helped Pemberton see the power of advertising. Unfortunately for Pemberton, he didn't live to see how successful his beverage could grow. He died in 1888 after selling the company. Just two years later, Coca-Cola was spending $11,000 on advertising. Profits came flooding in at nearly four times that amount, which would be around $1.4 million today. It was sold for five cents a bottle at drugstores and soon found in soda fountains and corner shops around the country. Greater success came from marketing the drink as a refreshing beverage rather than a medicinal product, which allowed the company to avoid a medical tax levied by the government. This embedded the company with a certain DNA. Alongside maximizing profits, their image, through advertising and expansion, was more important than anything else. By 1909, that $11,000 advertising budget looked minuscule. Coca-Cola was then spending $750,000 a year for promotions, or $24 million today. The company was growing into an American titan and quickly expanding all over the world. A bump in the road came when Coca-Cola's access to sugar was jeopardized. The United States, as part of its involvement in World War I, put in place quotas to ensure that vital ingredients like sugar would not be overused. This meant that bottlers inside the U.S. lacked a vital ingredient for production. Sales fell from 12 million bottles to 10 million, the first time they hadn't increased in the history of the company. But Coke was determined to safeguard its global growth and had learned how important the government was for business. It could ensure its profits by keeping in line with the state no matter what. Playing both sides. Between World War I and II, Coca-Cola was an unstoppable machine. Even in the worst year of the Great Depression of 1934, yearly profits were $14 million, $322 million today. By the time World War II broke out in 1939, Europe had been opening up and Germany had become a key market. As the country had been taken over by Adolf Hitler in the years prior, and the Nazis' vision for global dominance materialized, Coke continued to do business in the country. The company distanced itself from its American image and was even advertised next to the swastika. The American leader of the German branch communicated back to headquarters in letters that were signed Heil Hitler. Coke was given out at Nazi youth gatherings, and Nazi pamphlets featured Coke advertisements. And as Nazi Germany went to war, so did Coca-Cola. Company trucks were used to help deliver supplies, while the drink was given to injured soldiers. However, even the mighty Coca-Cola couldn't escape all the hardships of war. With Germany fighting wars on multiple fronts and encircled by enemies, supply chains were interrupted and ingredients became scarce. 
Most importantly, when the U.S. entered the war in 1943, the German plant lost access to the all-important Coca-Cola syrup. This led to the creation of a new drink that used grape and apple scraps, sugar beet, and whey, a byproduct of cheese. Executives named the drink Fanta, coming from the German word for fantasy. During the war, it sold approximately 3 million cases. Behind the scenes, though, the reality of that fantasy was unimaginably dark. Fanta was produced with slave labor inside one of Nazi Germany's most horrendous institutions, concentration camps. When the war came to an end, Coca-Cola headquarters in the U.S. saw the value of having a product like Fanta. When the war came to an end, Coca-Cola headquarters in the U.S. saw the value of having a product like Fanta. Fanta helped to diversify its product lineup, keeping Coke's position at the top of the soda industry, which had then grown to operate in 63 bottling plants around the world, costing just $5.5 million. This was one-fifth of net profits, making it a simple business choice. Especially in the developing world, bottlers were key to Coca-Cola's global strategy. They combined the patented syrup with water and sweeteners, transforming it into soda before packaging them. These are often effectively controlled by the corporation, but to avoid liability, usually a minority share is maintained. That's for good reason. Some of these bottlers have run businesses very differently than the United States. Allegations of bribery, corruption, misuse of funds, and even violence have been leveled at some of Coca-Cola's partners, especially in South America. And nowhere is a better example than in Colombia. Coca-Cola goes to Colombia. In 1979, Coke opened a bottling plant in Carepa, five hours north of Medellin. At first, it didn't find much success. The Civil War, known as La Violencia, just over two decades earlier, was still sending ripples through the economy. As Pablo Escobar's cartel grew more powerful in the 1980s, though, paramilitary forces waged a war on communists and any labor unions they were connected to. These paramilitaries were supported by the cartel, the Colombian army, and the United States. They also became a useful way for large companies to suppress labor rights. In Urabá, the area where Carepa is located, paramilitaries had already carried out acts of brutality. Even children and the elderly had been targeted. So, when Coca-Cola's Carepa bottling facility was fighting with its employees in the early 1990s, paramilitary groups quickly became involved. To cut costs, the plant's management had fired staff and made some workers labor through grueling 16-hour days. After a union hit back against the changes in 1993, the dispute turned bloody. Three of the union's leaders were swiftly assassinated one by one. The first vanished in April 1994. The second was taken into the forest and shot while the third was killed in front of his wife and children. Desperate to stop the bleeding, and without many other options, the union appealed directly to Coca-Cola to intervene. Despite sending letters, though, the company never wrote back. Meanwhile, discussions dragged on, and the union's lead negotiator was next in the firing line. One day, in 1996, while working at the plant's front gate, a motorcycle approached, the calling sign of death squads. Before there was time to respond, he was shot, before the gunman wandered slowly over to the body and followed up with eight more bullets. This brazen act of murder in broad daylight reflected the total power and brutality of these paramilitaries. That year, a record 277 labor unionists were assassinated. When the victim's grieving wife sought justice through legal action, she too was silenced, permanently. To send a final message, the union hall near the Carepa plant was set on fire, and any member who didn't resign immediately was promised the same fate. Management offered union members a one-way plane ticket out of town. With that, the union had been crushed. An investigation by Columbia's Human Rights Office followed, but murder charges were eventually dropped and the investigation was closed. Coca-Cola officially denied having any knowledge of the paramilitary's actions, but the union claimed otherwise and even launched a lawsuit against the company. Coke was accused of covering up its relationship with paramilitary groups. This wasn't the first time the company had been connected to organized violence either. In the 1970s, union members in Guatemala had been viciously gunned down. Coca-Cola's track record in South America earned it the nickname Killer Coke. One former Carepa plant worker, who is still in hiding to protect himself, said, Drinking Coca-Cola is like drinking the blood of the workers. While Coke was operating in the world of narcos, death squads, and corruption, on the other side of the world, it was drinking the water supply of an entire economy. Squeezing a town dry. 
When India invited multinational investment in the 1990s, policymakers didn't expect a crisis that would devour natural resources, threaten a town's existence, and hand out poisonous materials to citizens. Earlier, in 1977, Coca-Cola had been exiled from the country after a string of financial infringements. But in 1993, the company was allowed back in. Seven years later, Coca-Cola arrived in the south of India to the village of Plachimitha to construct one of its famous bottling plants. The company promised to bring jobs and an economic boost to the waning, dry, and poor agricultural area. Coca-Cola struck a deal to use 16 hectares of land and 300,000 liters of water a day. Then, not long after Coke's new plant opened its doors, locals started suffering. They found the water was less drinkable, pollution was in the soil, and the ground was beginning to sink. Since the area was a traditional agricultural economy, the damage to the land and water threatened the entire society. Coca-Cola refused to listen, and so villagers organized protests urging the government to pull the plug on the Plachamata facility. The story was picked up by national news, and non-government organizations soon joined the cause, including Greenpeace. One report found that the plant was using up to three times more water than it agreed to, around one and a half million liters a day. Coca-Cola initially denied this. It got worse, though. Coke had been distributing fertilizer to local farmers, made up of the black waste sludge from the factory. When this was tested by a British team at the University of Exeter, they found that there were high levels of lead, cadmium, and other potentially deadly substances that can cause cancer. Earlier that year, a scientific analysis had found toxins and pesticides inside Coca-Cola. These included lindane, which is used to treat scabies, and DDT, which is used to kill insects in agriculture and has been banned in the U.S. since the 70s. A government report backed up the findings, concluding that Coca-Cola had lied to the public. The company's influence has been much deeper than press release and advertising, though. Decades of funding and lobbying have shaped education and government, accelerating a growing worldwide crisis with no end in sight. A War of Information Coca-Cola has been fighting one of its most important wars in an unlikely arena. Schools. The Cola Wars with Pepsi throughout the 70s and 80s exposed a weak point for Coke. Young people. To change that, merchandise and advertising were released, aimed at children. Coke partnered with schools to be an exclusive drinks vendor and ran educational programs. These taught students about the chemical makeup of Coca-Cola and the economics of the multinational brand. Schools with struggling resources had been perfect targets to accept partnerships. Falling tax contributions from corporations, which dropped from 33 to 15 between the 1960s and 80s, left public institutions like schools with fewer resources than ever. When a student was punished for wearing a t-shirt with Coca-Cola's rival Pepsi during a program, it sparked outrage. The company eventually promised to pull back on targeting children but said that beverage choices were a, quote, benefit to the schools. Coke's caution came after the U.S. Surgeon General's 2001 report warned that obesity was an epidemic and that major lifestyle changes, including a healthier diet, were needed. One study found that for every 1% increase in soft drink consumption in the country, an extra 4.8% of the adult population becomes overweight. Some health professionals went so far as to compare soft drinks to tobacco. Coca-Cola has adapted by changing its strategy. The 21st century has seen the sugar drink present itself as a promoter of health. The company sponsors physical health and nutrition programs in over 100 countries. However, while the company presents this as a part of a concerted effort to improve physical well-being, there are clear reasons for this change in strategy. Coca-Cola now subscribes to an ethos of responsible marketing, which commits to no commercials in the classrooms. By running anti-obesity and health programs inside schools, the Coca-Cola logo and colors have found their way back into schools, keeping children exposed to the brand. These programs also function to promote the idea of increasing physical education activities instead of changing diet. In China, Coca-Cola has worked carefully through its own science organizations to influence government policy and avoid regulation. Just like in the U.S. facing a growing obesity epidemic, with rates doubling between 2004 and 2018. Now, over half of adults in China are considered overweight, and that number is only growing. The future of public health will depend on how governments and people can respond to the obesity epidemic. What's sure is that Coca-Cola has morphed and adapted to drastically different business environments, and it'll do it again, 
Above all else, Coke's priority is to increase profits. Maintaining its image through huge investments in advertising has made it one of the most valuable brands in history. But its dark history also has a trail of destruction, socially and environmentally, and now a global obesity epidemic that will be felt for generations to come.